Um, first of all, what was the inspiration behind your film? Well, first of all, I just want to say I'm excited to be back at Excel. This is an amazing festival, so thank you for having me. And, um, yeah, what I would say really inspired me to create my film. So my film was the first one we saw, The Line Between Black and White. And um, I really just wanted to tell the story of a black girl finally being understood in a space that she wouldn't expect to be. Um, I feel like I've heard stories from family members, you know, my mom, even me, you know, being in spaces where like, you know, corporate America, if you think about that, being the only black woman in that space and not knowing who you can confide in, or who those people you can really lean on or feel understood at all because of your race and, you know, gender. And so I feel with this story, I see a lot of myself in Ayana. I am a very pro-black person. I love my people. Um, but um, I wanted to make sure that this was a positive story where she found an ally and someone who she didn't expect to be one. I feel she had these preconceived notions about who Kathy was or what she represented. But once we kind of dive into the story a bit more, we realized she was someone who can be an ally and would support her um, during her journey being a young black girl in South Side of Chicago. Wow, and thank you so much for clapping for her. So one of the things that Addie represents that we talked about on the panel before, is we actually talked about, we had a Dream Keepers panel right before this, and we've got the Dream Keepers, we've got actually the founders and co-founders of Black Girls Film Camp, you know, they're sitting here. You know, I'm just, I'm curious, what was it like having the support from your Dream Keepers? And You've had other organizations, including mine, including True Star, and you know, so you have actually maximized having Dream Keepers in your life. I just want to hear that really quick. I feel like since an early age, I've always been a part of organizations and programs that I felt, you know, built me up into the person I am today. Um, I definitely feel with, you know, having BGSC in my corner, um, with this being like the first so solo short film I created. Um, Dr. Mika touched on that a little bit in her panel, you know. I'm so used to, you know, being applauded and having such community. And BGSC did that, but they also pushed me. Those writing rooms were something serious, in my life. You know, I had the idea, I had what I thought the film was gonna be, and they had to sit to the side, you know, I had this whole Jordan Peele vision. And they were like, you know, I, this is only be six minutes, and you can't really do all that you're hoping to do, or like, you know, Let's, let's try to recreate your vision in a way where you can create it in this six minute short film while also getting your message across. So just having like people like that, Dr. Mika, Miss Sierra, Miss Shamoria, you know, everyone in my corner really helping me, you know, craft my script on set with me. I think it pushed me and, and helped me, you know, create a, a short film that wasn't my original idea, but it definitely was something that I'm glad I was able to produce. Um, you know, you don't want to, like, you don't want to just go with your original thought. You need to have critique. You need to have that type of feedback. And they definitely gave me that. So having those type of people in my corner that I know for years to come, I'm still an alumni, and they're still supporting me. So I'm just glad that I have them and will continue to have that support. Well, thank you for sharing. And these long legs. And then, um, let's see, so Maya, I, I'm just really interested in what was the full motivation that caused you to really want to do this piece of work? Yeah, um, so Keep It To Yourself was inspired by similar, similar True Life events, also with uh, the influence of seeing a rise in teen violence in Chicago. And I wanted to use my film to show, you know, younger kids, you know, between age maybe 7 and 12, that like, what you post has meaning behind it, and how you how you interact with people also leaves a mark with somebody, and you never know what someone is going through. So I definitely feel like you know the bullying the bullying is not okay. Um, posting you should watch what you post on social media always, and I just wanted to create a story that you know younger children can understand and follow and know like okay maybe I shouldn't post this because we live in a generation where we're very tech savvy and you know kids six three you know. Ages, all of ages are on social media, and they're watching their parents. They're watching. They're they're growing up on social media. So my whole thing was um, for people to under for kids to understand. Hey, maybe I shouldn't post this, or maybe, maybe I should think about what I say before I say it to somebody. Because you know the antagonist. She didn't know what you know Layla was going through. She didn't know. So you know her picking and picking and picking and not understanding. Hey, maybe I should back up. Or, you know, maybe I should think before I say that. That's my whole thing. I always think before you say, think before you post, and just make sure, you know, uh, am, am I doing something for the greater good or not? 
Oh, amazing answer. You know, just in kind of feeling the sensibility that you have as a young filmmaker, do you feel like the genre of, of content that you want to create is going to have cause related or social message and meaning? Can you just speak a little into that for me? Yes, um, I definitely, um, I'm definitely one of those people that watch and really um, analyze, you know, my environment and where I am. And I think that's where my creativity stems from. You know, being able to sit and watch people and figure out, you know, how people think. Because once you put that on the screen, it's easy for someone to follow and understand because it's their everyday life. So creating content that others can understand and learn from, I think that's something that I want to get into. So. I love that. My production company, our tagline is Media on Purpose. So when I heard you started speaking, it sounded like media that was on purpose. <laughs> I love it. Um, Karis, I want to find out a little more of the, the, just the spirit behind Game Changers and where that motivation came from for you as well. Um, so I, I played sports my whole life, especially basketball, and I still play it now. And it's not, it is a personal story, but it's also about the teammates and like even the media with Angel Reese, Caitlin Clark, all that stuff. And I recently joined a sport called field hockey, which is a predominantly white sport. And my whole life, I've seen the little bits and pieces of the white players getting favored over the black players, matter whether it's a foul or a tech or whatever, the white teams getting favored over the black teams. And field hockey really brought that to life, especially like the we play teams up north, and they and my team is very very diverse. And it's nice to have coaches that are saying, hey, like this is going to happen because of the team we are playing and the team that we are. So that's basically what the inspiration behind the game changes. Thank you for sharing that. I love that it's true to life, you know, like your, your life is creating art. Um, what do you find, um, how is this going to impact the next gen? Like the messaging of what you're doing, like how is this going to impact others to understand through media? You're telling a story about something that's really happening. How do you feel like that's going to impact your generation? I hope it makes people realize that words really do affect people. Like in my movie, you saw she was playing great the first half. And the second, those words really hit her. It really threw her game off. So I hope people realize like when you, the things you say have an effect on the people around you, whether they're a teammate, a friend, no matter what, like what you say affects other people. And then let me ask you from a technical standpoint, what were some of the challenges you had in pulling off your project? Um, let's start over here real quickly. Um, tech, I'm trying to think. Lighting, yeah. sound, you know, just your locations, like, what did you find? Um, I'm, well, because part of my story was based inside of a school, I think finding a school was definitely an issue for me. And then also some schools, some lighting in different schools, they're not the best. So, you know, having to provide uh, lighting and everything um, for my film, I think that was key because, you know, some gyms are pretty dim. So I feel like uh, lighting was definitely a thing for me. Um, Camera-wise, everything was provided from Black Girls Film Camp, you know, so we had that support. So that's not where I would say I was so like lacking in, but definitely lighting because, you know, there's good lights everywhere. So. Yeah, I'll go next. I mean, Maya kind of said we had really great support from Black Girls Film Camp. So I can't think of like too many like technical issues I might have had on set for mine. And especially with it being a one setting film that kind of made it a bit seamless for me. And then the crew I had, I had uh, Mr. Keith, who's my cinematographer and assistant director, and he was just amazing on set. But like I said previously, I had this big vision of trying to do like the sunken place, like get out scene. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, I, I was really stuck on it. Really stuck on it. <laughs> um, and so I had to talk with Dr. Jamaica this year. I had to talk with my cinematographer, like, how can we do this in my aunt's doorway? Um, <laughs> So we had to like, you know, try to figure out like something kind of similar to that or something that like doable with what I was provided with. And um, the beginning, well, the middle scene where Ayana has like the vision of who the guest will be. So when the camera's spinning and then the door opens, um, you know, with the spinning part, my cinematographer had that down. He had all the equipment, but it was just like, how are we gonna get the like door to like swing open? And you know, we didn't have like a string or anything to pull it. So I remember having to like crouch under the camera. And I was like, hey, count to three. And then I had to slam the door on the wall. You know, a lot of things you gotta do as an independent filmmaker. But I made it work. I made it work. So that's the core memory for me. Thank you. And Karis, can you tell us just where we will kind of wrap up here? Yes, 
definitely location and casting are the hardest part, especially casting. Trying to find someone that can play basketball but also act at the same time. <laughs> we had some people in there that could act but couldn't play basketball. And then we had some people in there that could play basketball but their acting was kind of <laughs> yeah. um, my brother, we had to throw him in as the ref. Just gave him a whistle. I feel like that, that, that in um, location. Sorry. Um, like during when we filmed it, it was kind of like a season for travel basketball. So I had to find a place that didn't have a lot of people, and we did it at like a rec center. So that's another place that had like a lot of people, and we wanted to make sure that we had it to ourselves. So definitely casting and location. Wow, amazing. Well, I'm so proud of all of you. You made us know that we have a future that is bright and a present that is bright because you all are in it. And so this has been amazing to have the dream keepers. I'm one of your dream keepers. I'm adding myself to your list as well, but also the dreamers that are here. We are in need of you to continue to live your dreams, achieve them, and with excellence. And so we're so proud of you. Can we give them a round of applause?